Welcome to the Edward S. Epstein Symposium. It's also the third, third day of the Probability and Statistics Conference. I'm Bob Glahn, and Dick Hogan and I will be co-chairing this session. It's really a personal honor, honor for me to participate in this because I knew Ed. He was a good friend. I counted him as a friend. And uh, I think I've read almost everything that he put in print after about 1960. He was already established as a researcher at, uh, by the time I got into the Weather Bureau in 1958. He had a paper at about that time and so on. And he's published uh, about 50 papers after that. So this is a scientific meeting, but we want to honor really the whole man and not just his scientific accomplishments. We want to honor his achievements as a husband and a father and a mentor and a friend. Five members of his family are here with us today, and I think that speaks to the quality of life in the Epstein family. The program today, uh, it's, it's a full day program, and most of it is our 30 minute invited papers. Each paper is given by an expert in one of Ed's fields. They were hand chosen for people who have worked in that field and have many of them known Ed and have built on his work. There is one correction to the program. Dr. Van Duel uh, will not be able to be here because of a, an emergency, but his paper will be given ably by uh, David Unger, who is a co-worker and also is an invited speaker uh, here today also. You also may notice that, uh, well, you could notice at least, that this is being videotaped so that the uh, family can have a memento, uh, not only for themselves, but to share with members of the family who are not here, their grandchildren, <coughs> and perhaps uh, others to come. We have two sessions here besides the invited speakers and contributed papers that are uh, aimed to address broader aspects of Ed's life. One will be a panel discussion later on this morning at 11 o'clock in, in which we have several of Ed's uh, co-workers, graduate uh, people who have worked with him uh, under him as graduate students and so forth. And we also have the first session uh, of that nature to lead off today. And <coughs> uh, Dick Hallgren will be leading that. Uh, Dick Hallgren, uh, of course, the past director of the uh, National Weather Service and past executive secretary of the AMS and still internationally active in our profession. So Dick, it's all yours. Good morning. It's a bit early, though, isn't it? <laughs> and it was a pretty long walk to get here and so forth and so on. Hey, uh, let me start by saying uh, Ed and I intersected in some interesting ways, and I'm going to tick off three of them. One is that both of us got our PhDs on the same day from the same school, Penn State, January 1960. And he was going off to Michigan in the academic world, and I was going off to IBM in operations research. And we sort of said to each other, well, we'll see each other at the meetings. Well, what happened in 1963, he was on leave of absence from Michigan to uh, a science advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Science and Technology, working on the beginnings of World Weather Watch and the very, very early beginnings of GARP. And uh, whenever he finished his period there of a little over a year, guess what? I turned out to come in on leave of absence from IBM as science advisor, so we intersected again. And uh, then in 1973, uh, when I left the uh, associate administrator of NOAA position to go to the weather surface for the first time, Ed came in and replaced me. So uh, there were a lot of intersections over the years, but. Uh, it was just amazing. One of the things that and, uh, Ed 
provided uh, 75 pages or something on his early life, and I read those, and I know a great deal about his period at uh, Penn State, so I'm going to try and give a little capsule of that, although much of it is in the, uh, the book that Bob has put together. And by the way, it's wonderful working and sharing the, uh, the chair of uh, being co-chair with Bob uh, Glon because he does 95% of the work and I do 5% and uh, he never acknowledges that, so I wanted to try and acknowledge that this morning. When you look at Ed and his book, it was even in the first grade, the teacher said, gee, you're too smart for the first, first, first grade, and he started pushing him on. Then, uh, uh, doing a heavy summary, when it came to uh, middle school, yeah, I go in earlier into middle school than uh, is normal, and then all of a sudden, Gee, I finished middle school early, and I go into the Bronx High School of Science uh, early. And then you're finishing always because the teacher's finding out that he's too smart for the group that's there. And you start discovering that, hey, uh, this guy must have a high IQ or something because not that number of people will be making mistakes one after the other. And uh, then... Uh, at the age of 15, he applied to three universities you might have heard of, Harvard, Caltech, and the University of Chicago. And he was accepted at all three and uh, decided to go to Harvard with a full scholarship. And, uh, and of course, there again was very much at the top of the class and, and very, very active when you read uh, in the uh, Junior Astronomy Club, because he was majoring in astronomy, but he had enormous interest, it was obvious in that. Again, though, very clear, very high IQ. And, uh, and then, of course, he off to Columbia, University of Columbia for, uh, Columbia University for uh, a master's degree in statistics. So at 21, he already had that, and then as so nicely written in his obituary that uh, he discovered that, hey, at this period of time, you might wind up being drafted if you aren't careful. So like many people, he chose to uh, go off to meteorology school, which is a hell of a lot safer, frankly, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, wound up at Penn State. And, uh, and Penn State had I don't know how many uh, over the years, maybe 15 or 20 or more years of classes, groups of people coming in to uh, study meteorology for a year as a, as a second lieutenant and uh, so that they could become forecasters, et cetera. And Penn State was one of the universities that offered a degree, a bachelor's degree to those people that came in for that year. All of, uh, all of them, of course, had already had bachelor's degrees uh, prior to that. But in Ed's case, and, and all of the hundreds that went through there, and only Charlie Hostler said he thinks it's only one other person, they decided that, hey, we better give him a master's degree. So again, another indication of just how smart he was. And, uh, and then when he went off to the Air Force for the uh, four years, I think it was four, that he was required to serve. Uh, every other person went off uh, as a, uh, uh, into the forecasting world. He went to Air Force Cambridge Research Center. And I might add, it was, uh, when uh, Bill Bonner was, at the, uh, was in the class of Ed studying that first year at Penn State, and Bill Bonner <coughs> said they had this system, there were four or five of them they were trying to compete for the second highest grade on any exam. They already surrendered that Ed would have the highest. Okay. And uh, uh, so off to uh, Air Force Cambridge Research Center and Flagstaff and so forth and major paper on the vertical distribution, building the vertical distribution of ozone and so forth. And obviously he was starting to distinguish himself with contributions, not just being extremely high IQ. And then Penn State conned him back into, uh, uh, back to Penn State to, to, for his PhD. And uh, uh, 
lucky enough, I had already finished many of my courses uh, at that time, uh, but we did play on the softball team together, uh, Charlie Hostler's softball team that we had. Uh, Ed and I played on, on that uh, team and had a great time. And so, and so we both finished in January of 1960. And, uh, and this I know that over the years I would hear the professors, particularly Norberger, bragging about what a high IQ all of the graduates that they received PhDs uh, in meteorology had, a very high IQ they all had. And, uh, yeah, but they had never graduated more than one in, a, in any particular graduation up until uh, when Ed and I and Paul Julian, there were three of us, graduated on the uh, same day. And I've never been able to confirm it, but I feel I've heard that they were almost celebrating that they had both Ed and I graduating on the same day because they still could brag then about the average IQ, high IQ being in existence <laughs> at, uh, at, uh, in all of their graduating groups. Uh, so it was really, uh, I just wanted to try and bring out in the series, there was never one moment, one period where he wasn't identified as having a very high IQ. And I think that everyone knows that, that works with, worked with him over the years. Uh, then I wanted to also just spend a couple minutes here saying he was very active in AMS, contributed may, uh, continuously almost to AMS. He was chair of the Meteorological Statistics Committee in the late 60s. He was uh, uh, editor of the Journal of uh, of Applied Meteorology in the early 70s, 71 to 73. He was a counselor from 74 to 77. Uh, and I might have skipped one, and he was uh, associate editor of the new Journal of Climate from 88 to 94. He was active in many, many ways. And uh, is, I won't be trying to mention his papers because you people all be talking about him and you understood him. I never quite understood him. So he had a remarkable series of contributions to, uh, to the AMS, and I don't want to take away that he was active in AGU as an associate editor of the Journal of Physical, uh, Geophysical Research, et cetera, but I wanted to emphasize because I have a big bias towards uh, AMS. So it just was so wonderful to know Ed so well and sort of be with him over a very, very long period of time. When you look at it and you think that Ed, whatever, how, you, how he handled this Parkinson's for three decades, it's just amazing. It shows just how strong and determined he was and what a wonderful person. And, and then at the same time, you knew how wonderful a person he uh, was in a lot of ways. And then now we're going to turn to the family to try and give us all a feel for Ed, not in the professional world, but in their own house, life together, and so forth. So somehow we're going to try and do that here right now. And we're going to use these. I think we're going to, uh, let's see, we'll try and turn these around. One second. Okay. Morning, someone come up here. I'm Alice, and Ed and I never really figured out the day we met. We knew each other all our lives because his extended family and part of my mother's extended family knew each other way back when. Some of them went to school, and periodically uh, there were gatherings, and Ed would show up, and we, we just never knew <laughs> when we met. Um, but Ed... Um, I wanted to add a couple of things to what um, was just said by Dick, that Ed told me in school, through high school, 
he never took a note in class. He just listened and he got it. And I don't know what happened in graduate school or at Harvard, <laughs> but that's how he learned. He also learned um, to cook. He loved to cook. And he didn't cook in his household he, he, with his mother and his grandmother and his father, but he watched what was going on. And when he started at Penn State, he had been living before that at Harvard in a dorm. Then at Columbia, he was living at home. So when he went to Penn State, that was really the first time he was very independent, totally. So he and I think three or four gentlemen rented a house. And the arrangement was he would cook and they all others would clean. And that's how he did that. And when we were first married, he certainly could cook a lot better than I could. Um, when we lived out in Arizona, Deborah was born the day before my birthday. So that night he went home and he made a birthday cake from scratch, decorated it, put a, a diaper pin on it with the decorations and brought it to the hospital. This was out in, on an Indian reservation in a Quonset hut on an uh, ammunition depot. That was outside there. Um, when we lived in Ann Arbor, he loved to cook spaghetti sauce. He would spend all day doing it, and then we'd have it for a while, and that would be fine. Um, when we lived in Sweden, he, I had talked many years ago about a German-style pancake that you put into an oven and bake. And when we were in Sweden, there was a box cake, uh, pancake sort of thing, which tasted terrible, but he improvised it. And over the years, he refined it. And so now we have German-style Swedish pancakes that are absolutely wonderful. They're made in the oven, and you don't use syrup on top. You just use uh, powdered sugar and, and lemon juice. And we still do that. Um, I'm just trying to think what else some of the things. Oh, um, I wanted to thank Bob Guan and Dick Hallgren for all their hard work in gathering the symposium together. I know it took a great deal of effort, so I really appreciate that. Um, I'm just trying to think of anything else. Oh, er oh, Ed felt very strongly about family, and when, oh, with, I have to go back to the cooking. After Bill left for college, Ed came down into the kitchen, and he stood there, and he said, this isn't fun anymore, because he used to make Sunday breakfast for them. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm just trying to think. He felt very strongly about family. And when the kids uh, left home, one group lived in Michigan, another one lived in um, the Massachusetts area. We wanted to get them together again. And when they were grandchildren, we started Beach Week. So every year, for the past 27 years, we've had Beach Week, and whoever could come could come. That included the grandchildren. And we also had the grandchildren come to our house. The, the four oldest ones, um, there were two girls from the girl, the girl cousins and boys cousins, and they were close in age. So we would have them come to the house. We would take them on trips. We would do all sorts of fun things together to help bond them because they lived in different states and they didn't see each other very often. So family was very important. And um, he was a very gentle, noble, honorable person. Okay. Hi, I'm Deborah. I'm the, the oldest daughter. Um, so I thought I'd, we're all going to share some stories um, uh, growing up with Dad. When I started high school, um, Dad shifted his work schedule so that he could drive me to school, which was great. So for two years, I got you know six minutes in the car with just me and Dad, which was really nice. And one of the things he told me was that he had made a deliberate decision when we were young not to be a workaholic. And he, and, and he was always home for dinner, 5.30, 6 o'clock. We didn't eat late, but he was always home. And um, I know from my brief experience in academia that 
to be successful, that is very unusual. <laughs> Most people are working 24-7, um, but he found time for family, which was great. So when I was in high school, uh, about a, I think I was a junior, I, I must have been pre-calculus. I had a math teacher who assigned homework extra credit problems. And I was struggling, so I would ask Dad for help. And he would solve these problems. Now, he would do it using a different logic than we were taught. But he would do it. And I'd ha so I'd get all these extra credit problems done. And I don't know, the teacher never seemed to pick up on this. I didn't do nearly as well on the tests. But I did really well on my homework. And, and it really, when I thought about it, it was very uncharacteristic of my father to um, you know, do work for us, first of all, or you know, cheating in any way. Um, and I really didn't understand until my son was in high school. And I found myself doing his um, uh, vocabulary uh, homework. And, and I realized what it was. He did it. He couldn't help himself. It was so much fun. <laughs> he just, he was having so much fun doing the homework for me, he would do it. Um, and so I have that great memory of him. And the other thing that I thought I would mention is the fact that, you know, although my formative years were in the 50s and 60s, Dad never said anything or hinted at anything that would um, make you think of gen gender bias. For, for us, the world was always available and um, there were never any restrictions, just an expectation that we would be successful. And it was really quite remarkable in retrospect. Harry? Hello, my name's Harry Epstein. I'm the first son born, the second child. And my, I was born in State College, PA. So I was born a Nittany Lion, but I grew up a Wolverine. Growing up in Ann Arbor, while well, he was the professor of atmospheric and oceanic science, or when he started there, Meteorology and Oceanography was the title of the department. I believe now it's Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Space Sciences. Anyway, I remember when I was very young, preschool even, he would take me on the weekends to the East Engineering Building and up onto the roof, and there was, it looked like a small building on top of a building. It was one room, and that was where the weather station was. And all the maps kept coming out of the machines and rolls of paper and things like that. But it was very interesting and I went there quite a few times with him. Uh, I also remember that he was the first one to take me to a Michigan football game. And uh, of course I got hooked on that. I think my sister who just spoke got hooked on that and I've been to about 100 home games. She's probably been to about 200 of them. <laughs> More than that? Okay. And away, and away. Yes. Um, growing up, uh, one of the more significant times I had with him was when he drove with one other uh, adult, actually there were two other adults, our scouting group all the way to the very top of the upper peninsula of Michigan, and then we took a ferry to... Uh, Isle Royal National Park, which is a 50 mile long island on the north e edges of Lake Superior. And we hiked and camped for a week. And of course, driving took a couple of days because it's a very long trip just from Ann Arbor. It's about 16 hours, I think, of driving. And um, when I went to college, I did go to Michigan. I also have a degree from Penn State, but I went to Michigan for most of my schooling. And I started in chemical engineering, but I ended up graduating from the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Science. And I know that Deborah was gonna say something, but her son, his grandson, graduated from the Department of Atmospheric oceanic and space sciences too. So we've got a, a long line of Michigan AOS people. Thank you. 
I'm Nancy uh, Epstein Wilkie. I'm the third child. I'm the uh, youngest daughter. And um, I thought I'd just talk about some sn snippets. When I think of dad, I sort of have images that come to my mind. So I think of dad who would do the New York Times crossword puzzle or any crossword puzzle, and he usually did them in pen. Um, he would spend hours and hours uh, doing picture puzzles, especially when we were on vacation. He would stay up into the wee hours of the night just to get it finished. Um, when we lived in Sweden, he started making Rhea rugs um, by hand, and he completed two beautiful, gorgeous rugs, and he would spend hours doing that. Uh, I remember things like when he left Sweden, they gave him a cross-stitch project, one of his departing gift, and he worked on that. And it said in Swedish, five were invited, ten came, add water to the soup, and bid everyone welcome, which I think was very um, much like dad and, and, and mom as well. Um, I think about the fact that when I was in high school, I would spend a lot of time playing the piano and he would sit down and that's where we would talk. Um, and we can't forget dad's singing. <laughs> dad loved to sing songs to us. Our entire life he enjoyed doing this. He sang to us when we were kids, before we went to bed, in the car, when we were camping. Uh, and, and my favorite, when we saw the moon for the first time. And uh, he actually could uh, sing in tune quite well, but he couldn't stay in tune. He would change keys regularly. Um, his favorite songs were things like Chiquita Banana, uh, The Cannibal King, uh, There's a Hole in the Bottom of the Sea, uh, Throw It Out the Window, I See the Moon, Mares Eat Oats, and The Old Gray Mare. So a lot of camp songs, but um, those songs he sang to us, we sang to our children, and um, in fact, his oldest grandchild, Adrian, um, at Dad's memorial, had everybody singing um, The Cannibal King, <laughs> which is really endearing. Um, unlike my si siblings, I actually did not like asking Dad to help me with my homework. His explanations were above my head. Um, I think he was frustrated with me not knowing some of the basics the way I should, and I just, so I did not have him do my homework at all. But um, I think I realized that I just learned differently than he did, and I, I guess in some ways um, I was intimidated because he was in the sciences, which was something that I wasn't as geared toward, and at the time both my brother and sister were into the sciences, and they went to Michigan in the sciences, and um, so I ended up majoring in um, I went to a liberal arts school at Washington University. I didn't feel that I could be a third follower going to Michigan. And, um, and I, th I think I had trouble thinking that it was okay to be in the arts as opposed to the sciences. But that was really, that was just me. It really had nothing to do with how dad felt. Because as Deborah said, he was, he was all about um, just looking for our success, wanting us to be independent, wanting to, us to be able to do what was best for us. But there was never any predetermined you know, you should do this or you should do that. He never guided us. It was always about what we felt we should do and what we could do to be successful. And I think I realized that I ended up becoming an architect. And um, I did get to go to his alma mater because I went to Harvard for my graduate program. And I think I came home and I was discussing uh, building plans and systems with him. And, and he seemed impressed. And I think that was an area that was unfamiliar to him, which for me was great. And so it, it for me, it sort of validated the fact that he was knowing that he, in his quiet way, supported us whatever we, whatever we did and encouraged us in that way. So, Hi, I'm Bill. I'm the baby of the family. <laughs> um, like Nancy, I just, there are lots of different images that come up when I, when I think of him. Um, Early on, particularly um, when we lived in Michigan, we, we lived in Michi Michigan until I was 10. Um, I loved, we had property up near Saginaw Bay, and we would go camping for a week every summer. And I was always so impressed with how well organized Dad was and you know, how well he could deal with you know, all the tents and all the equipment and basically dealing with all of us um, for a week <laughs> camping out. Um, and of course, it was. You know, we, we had our dog, Wolf, who also a German Shepherd. Um, and it was always funny because, you know, if my father happened to get out of, out of the tent in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something, he'd come back and find the dog had crawled into his sleeping bag. Um, 
also while we were up there, Dad, um, he loved the outdoors. He, we had a uh, sailboat called, uh, a um, sunfish called, named Loudmouth Line. And I don't know, maybe when I was nine or so, he, he taught me how to sail. Um, and, you know, I have, um, he, you know, it was, very, it was a very good teacher. Um, but one thing, he didn't always explain a lot of the terminology, because I remember for many, many years, I had no clue what, what the term heartily actually meant, or whether it was one word or two, it sounded like heartily. Um, all I knew was that it just meant duck, because <laughs> otherwise you're going to get hit by a boom. Um, also, like everybody else, I loved Sunday breakfasts. Um, I love the German pancakes to this day. Almost every weekend now, my kids ask for, you know, can we have German pancakes this morning? Um, and they love them as well. Um, also, he, um, I also loved math growing up, and, and he would always take my calculus book, while I'm working on my problems, he'd take my calculus book and always look, go to the back end to look for the hardest problems just for fun, because that was his pastime. <laughs> um, there was also, he always wanted to try to teach us bridge. I don't think he did a particularly good job of it. Um, but it was always impressive when at least Nancy and I would try to play. Um, we, we'd get together and play. And you know, after these hands, he could basically recite to us what every person had in their hand, every card. It's like, I don't, I didn't remember what cards I had, but he could tell us. Um, yeah, and he would tell us exactly what we should have played. <laughs> Um, he was almost always very, you know, gentle, soft-spoken person, except for a few, there were a few situations. Singing was one of them. Um, he would make up for being out of tune by singing loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, that, and then there was, if we were driving in the car, when you have four kids, you know, and a dog, you know, of course, not buckled in, because, you know, you didn't do that back then. Um, but he would... You know, we'd in inevitably get into arguments, and he'd threaten really loudly. You know, do, do you, you know, you know, stop it, or I'm going to stop this car. Um, I, I do, I have to pull over. Or do I have to pull over and stop this car? I think I don't know if he ever actually did. I think he might have done it once, <laughs> um, but we were always just afraid of what might happen if he did. <laughs> so that usually was enough. Um, and yes, he he loved. He loved the word games, he loved puzzles, um, particularly like the jigsaw puzzles. I remember at least one time, you know, we'd started a, a jigsaw puzzle in the, in the uh, dining room and he was busy with it and finally, you know, we all go to bed, get up the next morning to go to school. I see him exactly in the same position. He's still working on it. He just spent the whole night. He loved it. He couldn't get away from it. And, and that definitely has been inherited because I know my wife and I, early on in our relationship did this exact same thing where we just could not remove ourselves and pulled all-nighters through just a jigsaw puzzle. Um, we also, uh, also growing up, I, I was always very proud, I, I grew up playing baseball, I loved playing baseball, and um, that was the one sport that I knew both, both of my parents were very good at. And I remember in eighth grade, um, my baseball team having a a parent-kid softball game, and I was just so proud because um, both of them um, were basically the best players on the parents' team. It's like <laughs> mom had better arm than most of the men out there, and, and dad, dad was playing great. <laughs> um, and you know, it was really good. He he um, never pushed us push any of us in any one direction, but I think what he garnered in us was an appreciation for learning and just striving to find something that interests us. I mean, because um, the four of us have gone into four very widely different fields, um, and you know, he encouraged us to just find something that interests us and follow that. And so I think that's it for me. Does anybody have any question they want to ask us? Oh, somebody has a question. Yes? Can you get the recipe for the German <laughs> <laughs> I can't give it to you offhand on an email. It really is uh, terrific. <laughs> I might be able to, actually. <laughs> okay, let's
Thank you very much. That that really was great. And knowing Ed, that's very uh, just just like him, and so on. So that's that's really great. Our first talk today, it's not the one that's up there, um, is by John Lewis. Uh, John tells me he was a farm boy from the orchards in uh, uh, Sacramento Valley. He studied at Chicago, Oklahoma. His mentors were Platzman and Sasaki, names you'll recognize. He's worked at NMC, he's worked at Fleet and Miracle. He was professor professor at the University of Illinois and uh, most appropriate for this particular seminar, he published Roots of Ensemble Forecasting in the Monthly Weather Review in 2005. So he's had numerous discussion with Ed over the years and uh, just, he told me just, just today, uh, he got the reprints from a bulletin uh, article which is on ensemble forecasting and you'll probably pass out a copy of that. So the title of his talk is Edward Epstein's Stochastic Dynamic Approach to Ensemble Weather Prediction. John? What a wonderful uh, uh, experience to hear the family. It, it closed the loop for me. Uh, Ed wrote a uh, oral history in 1993. He wrote, uh, I would call it an autobiography. And uh, Alice made that available to me. I've never had the privilege of studying a person and their work when that person also wrote an autobiography. But he wrote it in a mode that you get the feeling it was for his children and for his grandchildren. It is just so rich in his uh, experiences as a young man uh, with names of the teachers of every grade up to junior high but then he said, for some reason, I forgot all the junior high school teachers' names, and I didn't even remember the people at Bronx Science. I didn't remember their name, but I remembered all of the names of the grade school teachers. And he had a little comment about every one of them. And let me, before I get into the main part of the discussion here, let me just say, I don't believe I ever saw an autobiography of a person, science or otherwise, where the person was so happy as a young person. Happiness was part of uh, Ed Epstein, and he had a very normal childhood, and that was very remarkable from a family that was extremely poor. Father's family from Russia, mother's family from Alsace-Lorraine, came to Ellis Island in the 1880s, dirt poor. But as you heard him talk about his family, discussion of being poor never came up. And his father, Herman, was such a strong influence on him, basically never saying, we don't have enough money. And his father, he said, on occasion, would uh, make a statement like, uh, we don't have a lot of money, Ed, but we sure have fun. And 
he mentioned that after his dad took him to the the uh, handball courts under Yankee Stadium. And he said his father was an excellent handball player, ambidextrous, and he said he'd bring me down there and we'd play these games and he would be very competitive, but he'd include me in the game. And his mother and father just promoted this uh, normalcy for Elaine, his older sister, she was six years older, and uh, for himself, sent off to camp. And when I hear the, the stories about the camp, he loved camps. Camp Tioga. He, uh, he said, we, we slept in tents, the rain came down, we had fun, we played ball, I couldn't swim, at the end I could swim. And uh, just these uh, activities that uh, were so normal. And uh, I'm a great baseball fan, I have been since I could throw a baseball. Ed was a very pronounced baseball fan. He could look out of his kitchen window, 174 West Bronx, look down over the polo grounds. He said, I could look down there, I could see the polo grounds every morning. Yankee Stadium was very close. But this is what was very interesting to me about Ed. He said, you would have thought I would have been a fan of the New York Giants or the New York Yankees. He said, I wasn't. Why wasn't I? Who was I a fan of? The Brooklyn Dodgers down in Flatbush. He said the Yankees and the Giants had this great tradition through the whole first part of the 20th century, winning the National League, winning the American League. Here's the Brooklyn Dodgers with this irascible manager, Leo DeRocher, and they're on their way up. I was pulling for the underdog. And it tells you something about his personality that the family has uh, uh, told in such a personal, warm way, and it kind of completes the circle for me. I met him once, face to face, October 1971. I was just out of University of Oklahoma, working at Fleet Numerical, and I was having a heck of a time getting my ideas accepted. I was working in an area that wasn't understood too well by many. It was in variational mechanics applied to meteorology. And uh, four of my colleagues at Fleet Numerical were graduates of the University of Michigan. And I remember, it was Tom Grayson, I believe, he came up to me, he said, I know you're having a hard time getting your ideas across. The publication process isn't going real well. He said, talk to Ed. I said, Tom, talk to Ed. Who are you talking about? Ed Epstein. He said, you're going to Portland next month. Ed's gonna be there. Go up and talk to him about your issue with this variational mechanics. And I said, well, it seems kind of strange, but anyway, I'll do it. Meeting lasted a half hour. It was one of the greatest lifts I had in my young career. I never forgot it. I had sent him the paper. He was the editor of Journal of Applied Meteorology. He said, John, I read it. I understand it. It's good work, and it will be published. And he took it under his wing, went right through. And I said, boy, talk about getting over a hurdle. So I had this great respect for him. And then when I got interested in ensemble forecasting, late 90s, I said, I want to look at the people who really did the work. Talk to them. And I did talk to them, the three people who I feel are central figures in meteorological ensemble forecasting are these. In the Monte Carlo method, it's Ed Lorentz and Chuck Leaf. On the stochastic dynamic prediction side, without 
anybody else involved at Epstein. Two alternate methods that came into place during the 1960s. And so I, we needed to talk to those three people, which I did. And then I worked backwards to try to say, how did they get on that track? And so that's the essence of what I'll talk about today. And uh, maybe add a little bit. I always, when I do the historical studies, I always want to figure out the pathway. How did they get there? Who were the key people? What were the necessary stops on the way to getting there? And in Ed Epstein's case, there were about four key issues that needed to be satisfied. So let me, uh, and I should apologize, uh, Alice, that picture of Ed, you can see a little line where I cut around. That was the beautiful picture of you and Ed. I think it was not. <laughs> In 1993, uh, and uh, it's in the the uh, brochure that uh, Bob has constructed. I think it's on page 11. But uh, I really like that uh, picture of Ed. Uh, let me take a little time to talk about the research that these three men did. 1960s were, were the key years, 1960s. There was a philosophical context in which they did their work. I think that's extremely important. What's your time, John? Yeah, I just jabber. And I'm not going to get to cover everything, Bob. I'll just... But let me know when i got about five minutes left, would you? Light on. Okay, it says 1930. When it comes on, it will have five minutes. There's a yellow light on now. No, that's green. The next one oh. is yellow. And then red when you have Okay, yellow, when this comes on, I have five minutes? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover all the ground. I'll try to cover what I consider the main features. And the fact that the bulletins, reprints came... I think is a blessing for me. Some of the details of those interested, you can find them in that article. What I will present is information that isn't in that article. I've been working on this paper for about 20 years, getting various bits and pieces of it. So I've had a lot of chance to think about it. And uh, the if I get this to go forward. Do you just click or you can do a space bar? Space bar, okay. That's the book that I have admired through the decades that tells about the philosophical context of physics in the 20th century. David Bohm, a professor at MIT, wrote this book. Causality is basically another word for determinism knowing exact laws, getting exact predictions. Chance is the probability, not the exactness. And David Bohm talks about it beautifully. And it really is a battle between the classic physics from Newton on up to the 20th century, basically starting with Ernest Rutherford and Hans Geiger, his student when they were looking at the transmutation of uranium. And alpha particles, later named, coming out of the uranium, scintillations on a screen, Geiger got an instrument, measured the scintillations. We know the Geiger counter now to be used to find radioactivity. But they couldn't predict when the next alpha particle would come out. And all of a sudden, within physics, Newton's laws became suspect. Here comes Niels Bohr. Here comes Edwin Schrodinger. Here comes Albert Einstein, putting this chance aspect into physics. So in meteorology, you have this tradition 
of the classical Newtonian laws of mechanics vying against the new physics. Uncertainty against determinism. And into this field comes Ed Epstein, Ed Lorentz, and Chuck Leaf. So that is the, how many of you ever uh, got interested in, uh, I know some of you old fogies like myself know the answer to this, but uh, uh, James Burke had a PBS program called Connections. I really liked it. He could take a battle axe from a, a, a medieval war and trace back to some firecrackers in China or something. He could trace back like that. I, I just admired the program. So I said, in the spirit of James Burke, I wanted to trace back from, can you still hear me pretty good? Trace back from, uh, it may not be recorded. Oh. Yeah, you can use the mouse. Use, use the yeah. mouse. Yeah, you can use the mouse. Okay. There. Here's my papers out of the way here. How much time do I have left just to make sure? It says it right there. 15 minutes? Okay, good. I got plenty of time. There's Ed down on the left. Ed down on the left. That was taken at University of Michigan in 1960. That was the picture they took of him when he joined the faculty there. Chuck Leith, Cal Berkeley, mathematician, worked with Edward Teller, got into meteorology at NCAR in the 1960s. And of course we know Ed Lorenz, famous for his understanding of uh, chaotic systems. So if you go backwards from that picture up the line, what really drove these three men were actually two things, the Charney and others. That is the picture from 1952. There's Jewel Charney on the left. There's the young Norman Phillips next to him. Glenn Lewis, an excellent computer man next to uh, Norman Phillips, Nan Golub, another great programmer next to Glenn Lewis, and my professor at the University of Chicago on the far right, George Plotzman. They were key to getting the deterministic method of forecasting into meteorology. But at the same time, almost a few years later, a question came up, how far can you forecast into the future? And I especially remember the controversy that was going on at that time through interviews. I wasn't around in meteorology at that time. But I remember Fred Sanders told me, great professor of synoptic meteorology at MIT, he said, here comes the computer. Here comes numerical weather prediction. He said, I heard seminars from, he said, he said, people unnamed, he would not tell me their names, came in to MIT and he said, meteorology is going to now bow down before the power of the computer and mathematical physics and we are going to have an unbelievable success. He said, I didn't buy it. And he was right. Within a decade, these general circulation modelers, many of them Japanese, and that's why I chose this figure. Chuck Leith has to be added to this group when it says two-week limit. Who's on the lower row on the far left? Does anybody know who that is? A young Akio Arakawa. On the first row, third from the, second from the right, Akira Kasahara. Second row, far left, Manabi. Hiding in the middle, Kaikuro Miyakoda. These Japanese meteorologists had this joy of looking at numerical prediction in a general circulation sense 
And through the experiments that Jewel Charney really headed, by the mid-60s, two weeks seems to be the limit of useful prediction. And what does that mean? After two weeks, as I well knew at Fleet Numerical, you could walk up to the file of maps that uh, was spoken of when uh, uh, Ed's son on the far left, Harry. Harry, went up to the meteorology building and there were just maps. Well, when was the useful prediction? When you could go up to that map file, pull out the surface map for that month, and your forecast wasn't any better than the average map. And that's what they found, two weeks. So, all of a sudden, in the mid-60s, comes the idea. Can we extend two weeks? Can we get predictions beyond two weeks? And that's what led to the generation of these ideas of ensemble predictions. Instead of making one prediction, account for the uncertainty in all the elements of control that go into a prediction. The initial conditions, the boundary conditions, all the parameters, we don't know them very well. Can we make many predictions taking some kind of a random sample of these elements of control? The Monte Carlo method, followed by Leith and Lorentz, came down from Stanislaw Ulam and Nick, uh, Nick Metropolis, two physicists. They developed in the context of the issues following the atomic bomb. How can you understand the path of a neutron going into a material like uranium? You need many samples of the path of the neutron. Does it get scattered? Does it get absorbed? What happens to it? That philosophy came down to Leith and Lorentz. What happened with Ed Epstein? How did he get on that trail? Every science has, scientist has an epiphany. And Ed said his epiphany took place in March 1968. He went to a statistical conference in Hartford, Connecticut, where Ed Lorenz was giving a paper, Ed Epstein was giving a paper, and Ed Epstein used the Monte Carlo method with a low order nonlinear model as so typical of Ed Lorenz. And so he followed let me see if I can, I've got a, another slide down the row here, right there. Without going into a lot of explanation here, that circle on the right says, I don't quite know the initial condition for the capital U, which is a, in the context of this problem, Osborne Reynolds experiment. I don't quite know the value of V, which is the turbulent component, but I want to predict the future state of this turbulent motion. But I have to choose points within this circle of uncertainty. Do those trajectories come together? Do they go apart? And Ed Lorenz presented the paper. Ed Epstein saw the trajectories and he said, instantly, I needed to know about the dispersion of this glob of points. That's how he described it to me. I saw this glob of points. If you can imagine, instead of two points in that initial circle, you had 100 points, and you followed each of the 100 trajectories. What was the dispersion? Did they go apart? Did they come together? And he said, I don't want to do it the way they do in Monte Carlo. Ed never followed anything. He never, that's what I realized, he saw another way. And why did he find another way? He studied under two of the greatest statisticians in the 20th century. One 
was a statistics professor at Harvard, Fred Mosteller. If you look at Mosteller's work, you just... Ed was an astronomer. He goes into Harvard studying astronomy. But it happens that so many times, under the influence of a great teacher, changes the path. He took the course from Fred Mosteller, and he said, wow, statistics is my calling. He finished magna cum laude from Harvard, top 4%, astronomy the major, but now he goes to Columbia, gets an MBA at Columbia, which is kind of interesting to me. Statistics, but is an MBA. And then later, not only does he come under Mosteller, he comes under the influence at Michigan of a man named Leonard Jimmy Savage, great professor at Yale for the rest of his career. Mosteller and Savage, those were his mentors. Yes, he studied under Hans Panofsky, but these statisticians were his mentors. And when he saw the problem that Ed Lorenz was working on, he said, I've got a different way to do it. It's well described in the papers that have now got reprinted. My goal in writing the papers was twofold. I wanted to find his path to get there, but I also wanted to compare Monte Carlo with stochastic dynamic prediction. I heard so much negative about stochastic dynamic prediction. I said, I don't see the basis for it. I don't see the basis for it. So I wanted to find a problem, not only where I could get a nice deterministic forecast, but where I could find the ag exact probability density function that went with the forecast. It took me quite a few months, but I was able to do it. And I compared the two methods. Even though it wasn't a full-fledged meteorological model, it was a very demanding model. And what I found, to my great satisfaction, was the results that came out of Ed Epstein's stochastic dynamic process was absolutely as good as Monte Carlo, and Monte Carlo only became as good as SDP if I took a huge number of members of the Monte Carlo method, way beyond the uh, number of elements of control. And so this has many values to me. I look at ensemble forecasts every day that come out of ECMWF, that come out of NSEP. What I found in this study and now other studies, at least between these two methodologies, unless the number of members in Monte Carlo far outweigh the number of elements of control for the model, and that means the number of things you have to specify before the model can run. Does anybody have an idea how many elements of control are necessary this day in Reading, England to start their forecast using their spectral model? Let me tell you, 10 raised to the ninth power. One billion pieces of information have to be given to that model to make its forecast. How many members come out of their ensemble forecasting? 51. They make 51 separate forecasts. They're pushing their computer to the limit every 12 hours to make 51 separate forecasts to get their Monte Carlo. What's the ratio between the number of elements of control, 51, to the number of, number of members, 51, 
to the number of elements of control, 51 divided by 10 to the ninth. It makes me realize that the statistics that come out of ensemble prediction today, even though they look good, the spaghetti diagrams, the whatever, you better be careful in trying to put your finger and hand on the statistics of the ensemble forecast. And as a person in data assimilation, I need to use the statistics of ensemble forecasting, whether it's from Ed's method or the Monte Carlo method. I need those statistics to meld that with observations to come up with a better estimate. And what it showed me is you better be suspect, suspect of a product that has so few members compared to the number of elements of control. So that's what I came away with uh, from the study. And uh, I've got 52 seconds left. <laughs> so I'll stop there and uh, basically say that uh, I came away from the study with a great respect for all the people I studied, Chuck Leith, Ed Lorenz. Ed Lorenz, very generous in his views, Ed Epstein. Learned a lot about ensemble prediction and realized we're still on the forefront of trying to go beyond this two-week limit. And when I talk to the people at ECMWF who are now doing the work, their dream is that through a better model that incorporates ice and the ocean into the models, doing the ensemble forecasting, taking account of uncertainty and in not only initial conditions, boundary conditions, parameters, they can go to a meaningful seasonal prediction. Basically, in three months, is it going to be colder than normal? Are we going to get more precipitation than normal? We don't do that good at all. I live in the Sierras. I live right next to Squaw Valley. Three years ago, at the Sierra Snow Lab, where the skiers love it, that's the 1960 Winter Olympics, Squaw Valley, we had 62 feet of snow. At my house, at a little lower elevation, I had 32 feet. I looked at all the seasonal predictions in that year, going back two months, three months, no one, no one said we would have more precipitation than normal. And I just said, what a challenging problem, what a hard problem. But these ideas have really started a process that I think is valuable. And the thing that I loved about Ed as he told me, very sick at the time, but his mind so sharp. He said, John, I never, ever thought about the methodology that I created being used in operations. I was interested in variance. I was a statistician. The fact that computers advanced so quickly, I didn't see it. And so he was driven by a philosophy, not a practicality. And so that he was kind of a dreamer. He was uh, a person whose boldness uh, was outstanding. And uh, his two students, Rex Fleming, who we'll talk next, Eric Pitcher, the three of them, I just look at the work they did and the respect they got around the world, mostly from Ro Ro Rossby protégés, very strong people. This is a great way to go. And that's what Ed did. He was bold. And I admired him so much for his boldness. And it was wonderful to briefly know him and to basically see his contribution in its full glory. Thank you, John. Yeah. One question for John. One question. Anybody? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Um, 
the meeting that he mentioned in, uh, in Hartford, that was the first statistical conference, although it didn't have quite the name that we have today, and I was there. The uh, next paper is by Rex Fleming. Uh, Rex got his PhD at the University of Michigan under Wien Nielsen and Ed Epstein. He's done research at NOAA and, and the UCAR. He holds several patents. He, has the, he holds the Department of Commerce gold medal, and he's a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And uh, I think most importantly for this conference, he actually worked with Ed on SDP. And, uh, I mean, he was there when it happened. So the title of his talk is Review of the Merits of Statistic Dynamic Prediction Equation and the Monte Carlo Approach in Modeling and Understanding Systems. Correct? We have 15 minutes. I'd like to get the floor as fast as I can. You've already heard a great deal, so I don't need to repeat too many things. The fundamental difference, Monte Carlo, you're taking a finite sample of deviates. Stochastic dynamic approach, you're taking an infinite ensemble of random deviates, both with the same variance. Monte Carlo approach, if you look at it from that perspective, is really just an approximation to the stochastic dynamic method. However, stochastic dynamic method's got a couple of minor problems. One is the number of equations is magnifies significantly. Second, there's this closure issue. The closure issue is if you forecast the mean of a variable x calling it mu, and forecast all those means, those forecasts involve second moments. Second moments about the mean. Second moments involve third moments about the mean. So you have an infinite closure problem. Moments of n require moments knowledge of n plus 1. We're going to look at a, a practical model, a very interesting one, Lorenz's famous uh, strange attractor equations, and uh, look at both techniques of how they work in such a model. Clearly, the Monte Carlo approach is the only practical method in today's world. You just, with supercomputers that have many, many processors involved, it's perfect for the Monte Carlo. If you use Fortran to write down the equations, as you can see here, x, y, and z, and call them x1, x2, x3 to make things more convenient, you can see that just adding an index next to the equations, j, uh, and then let j range from 1 to k, where k is the number of your ensemble members, if you have 40,000 processors, which is easy to do in today's world, 40,000 processors, and you, have, you can go with 40,000 initial states in a Monte Carlo approach and solve them all instantaneously. It's just the perfect way to go. However, there is something about the stochastic dynamic technique that few people really know about, and I'm going to share that with you today, because there is an intrinsic value that uh, is not obvious. First of all, uh, the equations are in the preprint volumes. I'm not going to go through that. It takes too much time. But I will show you results of deterministic forecasts of the Lorenz equations, stochastic dynamic 2, which were the third moments are assumed to be 0, SD3, including third moments, including a proper closure, and Monte Carlo. We'll look at all of these real quickly. Here is the uh, x1 versus x3. Uh, you can see in this d, r equal 14 is a, a fixed point solution, not chaos. That'll be r equals 28. And here we see that there's initial uh, pretty wide uh, movement initially, but then it zeroes into uh, the theoretical prediction of x3 equals r minus 1 or 13, and x1 equals x2, which is 0. Um, this is the stochastic dynamic approach. The deterministic approach gives the same answers, x3 equals 13, x1 equals x2, but plus or minus 5 is the theoretical solution. The actual solution in this case, numerically, is minus 5. Stochastic dynamic prediction without the third moments gives you the correct answer that x3 equals 13, 
and x1 equals x2, but not minus 5. In fact, the answer is near 0. Is this correct? Well, we have to look at the Monte Carlo. 40,000 samples. Again, now, when this thing is evolving from the beginning, it's wandering quite a bit. So 40,000 samples, each starting with an ever so slight value of 1, 0, 1, which are the three starting conditions of x1, x2, x3. You can imagine 40,000 ensemble members going around here. We're getting a very wide variance in the beginning, and that's indeed what happens. Here we see the stochastic dynamic technique with dropping third moments actually doesn't work. You have to have the third moments because it doesn't capture this negative shift. Uh, that's not minus two. It's it was it should be. It's uh, it's a wrong number. With the third moment e included, we get all the correct answers. You get x3 equals uh, 13. We get uh, the variance x1 equals x2 at minus 2.5. So we get perfect answers which agree with the Monte Carlo. Moreover, with the proper closure, and that's part of the next paper, I'm not going to go into that now, uh, you can not only get over time here the solution of the mean value, you get the variance of x2, for example, sigma 2, 2, which is variable 7 here. There's an initial random uncertainty here, which you can see, but the stochastic dynamic approach gives you precisely the correct answer on both the mean value of all the variables and the variance of the variables, matching the Monte Carlo variance precisely. Here's a greater challenge. The, this is R equal 28. This is the chaos. This is the strange attractor of Lorenz. You can see that uh, X3 now is uh, enormous variation. It was a constant before. Now it's an enormous variation. If we look at tau 1, 2, 3, let's back that up a little bit. This is a, a third moment of all three variables. And here you see an enormous initial randomness that takes place. It goes up to, up to 100, drops down to over 700, back up again, oscillates for a while, goes up to over 300, and then you have this enormous uh, long period of jostling, turbulent jostling. And that's what this, the Monte Carlo approach gives you. Now, with, this, with the fixed point solution, all the moments converge to constant values. And if we look at this one, it looks like, well, it's not, it's not a constant value, but it seems to be in some kind of a steady state mode out here. That led me to believe maybe we could do, it, it must be some way to, to approach something like the fixed point solutions. And from theory, we know that in any nonlinear system that's bounded and dissipative, which the Lorenz system is, these trajectories eventually toward some, tend towards some bounded value of zero volume. Now, zero volume could be a fixed point, it could be a limit cycle, or it could be a strange attractor. In, in Lorenz's case, it's a strange attractor, which has an, a fractal index of 2.02, .02, so it's not a volume, it's a zero volume. So I had a discussion a few years ago with myself. Uh, the left side of my brain with the right side. The right side is your creative side, and that's in pink here, and the, the, the left side is in, in black. So I asked myself, what if we just flood this strange attractor with thousands of Monte Carlo samples? And the other side of me said, well, how many? He says, I don't know, let's experiment. So what about that distracting Monte Carlo jostling we saw that went from 2,000 iterations out to 8,000? And that's just time average. Well, how many iterations do we average over? Let's experiment. How do you know when you have the right answer? When the numbers stop changing. Or when the time variance gets smaller and smaller, which it should, when you increase the sample size and, and lengthen the time averaging size. Sounds like a lot of calculations. It is, but let's do it anyway. So we did. Here is the solution of a one of the third moments to 113, it's a mean value of 400.6. What we're looking at is the time variance about that mean value as a function of sample size on the left 
and numbers of iterations used on the right. If you get down to even a thousand as a sample size, you can see that the variance is around 900 to 1,000. Well, if 1,000 is long, on the order of 400, 500. But that's the same amount of variance as your mean value, so that's worthless. You've got to keep going all the way down to 40,000 sample sizes. When you get down there, you can see that you can, you can time average over 250 or 1,000 or 4,000 iterations and get basically the same variance. A variance that small tells you you really do have the right numbers. You really do have uh, merged constant values of the statistics of your, your attractor. Now forget the detail here, I'll just tell you the answers about, uh, it's kind of a, an eye chart here. Uh, the red numbers are values of these Monte Carlo averages. And uh, I don't think I want to go into too much detail here except that the point about this Lorenz system, the statistics of X1 and X2 are symmetric. So if you have an odd number of ones and twos, uh, those moments will go to zero. If you have an even number, they become very large. And if you look at, uh, for example here, tau 112, it's got an odd number of ones and twos, it goes to zero. Tau 113, it's got an even number, it goes to 400.6, and so forth. Now, the important thing about this is, using those, that Monte Carlo approach, you can get all those 19 numbers for the means, the variances, and the third moments. But you don't need to go through all those calculations if you have the stochastic dynamic equations. All you have to do is write them down on a piece of paper. And when the, that attractor reaches a point where all the moments are steady state, the left-hand side of your stochastic dynamic equations give you the answers. If you have just two inputs, in this case, two inputs of the mean of x of x3 and its variance, those two inputs added to your stochastic equations with the left-hand side set to zero, you can co compute all of the other 19 moments precisely. All you need is a pencil, a paper, and a hand calculator. For example, if you look at x1 there in the middle of the screen, uh, from that, x1 equal to 0, you get x1 equals x2 from the equations. If you look at x2 equal to 0, you get this relationship here. And we know now for the chaos case that x3 is not equal to r plus 1, or minus 1. Therefore, you know that x1 must be 0. Therefore, x2 is 0. From uh, equations 3 and 4 derivatives equal to 0, you get x4 equals x5 equal to bx3. And we know what B is, and you know what X3 is from up here, so you get this answer. If you look at X9 equal to zero, you get this long expression, but X1 and X2 are zero, so you end up with just a third moment of the, all three variables equal to B times the variance of X9. And these numbers, 62.8 for those variances, and this 198.2 for that third moment, which you saw going across the screen in a crazy fashion, that's the, the final number that you end up with. Those relationships fall out exactly from Ed Epstein's equations. Um, if you just looked at the attractor itself, the Lorenz attractor visually, you would never suspect that the third moment, the correlation of all three variables, is actually equal to the variance. So what happens here, you can build upon one relationship adding to another and end up with many interesting relationships that show you the full nonlinearity of this attractor. And it's revealed exactly by the stochastic equations. One final uh, result, and I'll stop. Um, this is an, a relationship involves all three variances of the three variables. Never could you ever look at that attractor and, and, and see that happening. But not only are they related, they're precisely related by these constants that are part of the equations. And you add up the numbers and you get precisely what you, what you need. Stated another way is you simply write down Ed's equations following the, the, the forecast, the recipe, and the articles that we have. You will write the, as you're writing those down, you're getting the answers ahead of time for that attractor. Only obtainable, of course, by a, a full 
blown mini sample size Monte Carlo approach. But with just a couple of numbers of that Monte Carlo approach, you can write the, the entire relationship for all the moments. It gives you a deeper insight into the nonlinear nature of nonlinear systems. So it's, it's an amazing, it's not really amazing, it's fundamentally exactly mathematical. It's the mathematical calculus of uncertainty that it came up with. Thank you. And thank you, Ed, for your inspiration. How about one? We'll move on to the second one. Anybody questions? This might also relate to your next talk, uh, Rex, but I'll uh, phrase it here and maybe you can even think about it after the mm -hmm. next discussion. Uh, the last few months I talked to the scientists at ECMWF who are working with Monte Carlo and certainly know as stochastic dynamic methodology. And I specifically asked them, I said, do you feel that the SDP approach has a viable way to do ensemble predictions? And Nels Weddy, who's one of the key people working there, he basically said the number of equations doesn't bother him. In other words, right now they have 10 to the 9 elements of control. How many equations do you have for SDP? 10 to the 18th. But by 2020, he said, the number of instructions per second that we're going to be able to handle is what he called exascale computing, basically 10 to the 18th instructions per second. So he said, I'm not so worried about the number of equations. I'm worried about the closure issues, and uh, I'm not sure whether SVP would have a chance to compete against uh, Monte Carlo. So he basically said the jury's out. But I just, maybe you want to wait until you get through your other talk to, to answer it, but uh, yeah. that's a key issue. I can give you an answer to that question. But first, uh, through the years, I've been always asked, you know, how do you close these equations? And I never knew how to do it. We tried various techniques. But, uh, are you started on I'm starting on my Zagoan. Oh, right. <laughs> how, how long is this? How much is 15 this? minutes. Okay. I'll probably do it in less. Um, we're going to do the closure for the third moment equations, which involve fourth moments, using those same Lorenz equations. For the fixed point solution, R equal to 14, and for the chaos solution, R equal to 28. The closure will be a little bit different for each type, of course, but in each case we have to solve two problems. One is the initial randomness, which you saw from that previous presentation of the triple moment of one, two, three, how chaotic it was. And the second part, of course, is, uh, is, is the, the final solution in the moment itself, its final value. So there's two things that diametrically opposed in solving equations, but there's a way to do it, it turns out, and it, it, we'll just go through that quickly. First of all, here again is the Monte Carlo solution for the fixed point. So R equal 14 is the answer, we get the correct answer, and, and here is the mean of the Monte Carlo solution. Again, 40,000 initial states, all very near this point down here, are all booming out in this direction you're going to have a huge amount of variability in this opening process. And that's part of the initial randomness problem. With a fixed point solution, uh, all of the moments converge to a constant value. In the case of X3, since it converges to the number 13, those moments converge to zero. So any second, third, or fourth moment that has one or more threes as an index will go to zero. So indeed we see, for example, sigma 1, 3, 2, 3, and 3, 3 go to zero, and these other ones without a 3 in it have finite numbers. Third moments, uh, they all go to zero except those which have a just ones and twos, no 3 in it, and so forth. Uh, I won't go into some of this detail about <laughs> platycurtic versus leptocurtic uh, fourth moments, but uh, maybe we'll 
discuss that another time. Um, for, the, for this closure, for the fixed point solutions, it should be easy, and it is. But we still have to solve this initial explosive randomness problem. The main idea here in this closure is you let the physics do the driving as, as far as possible. Now, since all the fourth moments either converge to that fixed point platocurtic value of 0.632 or 0, uh, we're going to let those things uh, be multiplied. They're going to put them in normal form, the normal form for a fourth moment. You'll see what that is later. And uh, then just uh, not damp the third moments, which go to zero explicitly or, or uh, individually, but we will need to damp those, uh, in general, all of those third moment equations with non-zero fourth moments, again, to cope with that initial randomness. To do this is, is fairly simple. We, we try to make it happen at 4,000 iterations into the future. Um, so you're using a, a damping coefficient, not that works after 10 iterations or even 100 or 1,000, but after 4,000 iterations, we want those uh, terms to go to zero. And with the proper damping term, greater than 11.7, we get the right answers. I used 12, and here is the results that you get. Went too quick. Uh, again, this is the closure. Uh, for the fixed point solutions, we get the initial randomness, which is quite large, uh, matched very well. Purple is the Monte Carlo. Uh, I'm sorry, salmon is the Monte Carlo. Purple is the stochastic dynamic third moments. They agree again in the initial randomness and they agree in the final answer. So that works pretty fine. This is the chaos with R equal to 28. Here, X3 is not stationary, quite the opposite, because we've got X1 versus X3 here. You can see it's very chaotic. This is part of the Lorenz attractor. And again, the important point here is that the probability distributions between x1 and x2, at least for this attractor, are symmetric. And that is gives you the results I mentioned earlier. Again, don't look at all the detail here, but those moments, which are third moments, which we have an odd number of ones and twos, go to zero. If they have an even number, they have a finite value. Uh, here are the fourth moments, the same thing. Uh, here is a lambda 1-1. One, one. This is the fourth moment. It's got an odd number of 1s and 2s, therefore it goes to 0. Here's a lambda triple 1, even number. It has a finite value, and so forth. Again, for this chaos case, the number one rule in the closure is to let the physics do as much as possible by itself. Um, we're going to be looking at, uh, we've already mentioned about the statistical symmetry, that, that helps quite a bit with this case. But even if we didn't have that, we could still close these equations. We do not damp the third moment prediction equations where those third moments ultimately approach zero. Uh, however, again, we do need a small damping term, uh, the same for each of those third moment equations, which help control the degree of that initial randomness. All the fourth moments either approach zero or, well, all those that do approach zero, we set to their normal form. Uh, and the normal form of any fourth moment is you, you just permute those uh, four indices into products of two indices. And uh, that's what a fourth moment looks like. It's, it's a triple product of, of, of two second moment terms. And uh, one might think because the, those fourth moment terms which go to zero, you should initially set them to zero, but you don't. You, do, you want those fourth moment terms to go wild as they want to, as the physics drives them in the beginning. We know eventually they'll go to zero, but we don't want them to go there in the beginning. Here's a, a picture of the five active fourth moments that occur in four third moment prediction equations. So here's the, the four third moment prediction equations. If you look at these fourth moments and, and calculate their, what's called the ketosis, which is the, the fourth moment calculated divided by the fourth moment normal version of it, you get less than one. If it's less than one, that means it's platycurtic. That means that the mean distribution is flat. If you think of a platypus, 
and a flat bill. It's just the Greek word. So it's an, not a normal distribution like this, but sort of a flat near the mean. That's a platycurtic fourth moment. Most of these are platycurtic, and a few of them are leptocurtic, where it's not, it's sharper than normal. Um, here are the rules for closing these equations. It took me several years to figure these out, but finally we did. Um, we need a single damping term for those third moments which go to zero anyway. Again, to guide them through that initial randomness phase. Then we, we optimize that term by looking at all of those variables which should go to zero and optimize them at 4,000 iterations into the future. That's your criteria. You run it through 4,000 iterations. If you don't have a damping term that takes all of those terms which go to zero, and terms 1, 2, 6, 8, 10, 11, 13, and 16, all of those variables go to zero naturally due to the physics of this strange attractor. You want all of those to be precisely zero. We do this in double precision, and I look at 12 digits to the right of the decimal point. If I see 11 zeros and not 12, I gotta go a little bit further with the damping coefficient. On X1, I'll see 12 zeros in the X10, which is the triple correlation of variable one. It still won't be, it might have 11 zeros and an eight. It's not good enough. I take it a little bit further till I get 12 zeros on every variable. That saves me from, from another step if I get that, that precise. So that's the first part of the closure, getting that DK at the right values. In this case, it's 16.8. The second part is getting those unique third moment terms. There were four of them that were active, with active fourth moment lambdas in there. We need to get those damped to match uh, the final solution. And what we have to do is, is compute a damping term after multiplying those fourth moment terms by a factor of 1.2. Why? Well, because if you go down here to this bottom section in blue, if we don't damp it with 1.2 and just leave them as their, their computed values, which you end up with on the right-hand side of these equations, and of course you want the left-hand side to be zero, so the right-hand side has to balance, if you calculate all the terms in the equation, you see that it comes out to be minus 9,060, but it goes to zero because this particular lambda is 9,060. So if I just leave these lambda terms as the Monte Carlo values would suggest, we can't damp the equations. So we have to multiply them by 1.2, and when you do that, you end up with a, a solution. You can now compute a damping term because you have a bigger number 0.2 times that term, and you can compute the damping term. This should do for each of those third moment equations. Now here's the summary. Uh, first of all, if you just look at the initial damping term, uh, randomly picked to handle that initial randomness, uh, you don't get what your answer here is, is supposed to be. You want zero for x1, and these numbers here are all supposed to be in red. These are the precise numbers given by the stochastic dynamic equations from my first talk and the pre precise numbers given by the Monte Carlo solutions. Now we're trying to not just keep computing with math with the paper and pencil and a hand calculator. We're doing the computer and projecting, trying to close them as you would any normal prediction model. So we don't do very well with just an ordinary damping term, you have to get the precise one, that's 16.8, and now we get exactly zero for x1, which is what we wanted, but we still don't have the right answers for these, very, these guys over here. So we go to that damping term for dk1, which serves x12, and when you do that, you, you get very close to the right answer, 400.2 versus 400.6, but not exact. You go to the next one, you get very close to the right answer, but not exact. Finally, when you get X17 exact, everything becomes exact, and that's because X17 impacts X14, which impacts X12. So once you get all of them correct, you get the precise correct answers 
for all 19 variables. You don't have to do them in sequence like I did, but I just wanted to show it that way so you could see how the contribution of each term comes through. Now here's the final results. This is a numerical prediction problem, just like you could do any numerical model, uh, starting with initial conditions, starting with uh, my closure scheme. Here we see this is variable X3, which does have a final solution of 23.55. It goes through its initial randomness in the beginning, up to over 40, uh, starts with zero, goes up over 40. Uh, the stochastic dynamic is right at 40. Monte Carlo is 42, so if you can just see the purple above it. It oscillates, we're picking up the randomness, and they both converge to the exact correct answer. Here's a tougher case. This is the triple correlation. It's the third, it's the skewness of X3, which is variable 19. It goes up to around 600. You can't see it, but the Monte Carlo goes up to 400. And it's only because the orange blots out the purple can you not see that. Then it drops all the way down to 3,700. That's the blue, that's the Monte Carlo. Stochastic dynamic drops down to like 3,600. You can see that difference. So we're picking up that initial randomness precisely. Well, it's not precise, but it's, it's very, very close. Uh, and then we wander about, and we eventually end up with the exact same solution at 4,000 iterations. And one last case here. This is a blow-up of the first 200 iterations of tau 133. This is a third moment which should go to zero because it has an odd number of uh, ones and twos. It does go to zero, as you can see out here, even close to zero at 200 iterations. And here is that initial randomness. It goes ever so slightly up, comes down around 1,200. We're almost right on in terms of phase, very close in amplitude. And then we oscillate together Monte Carlo and stochastic dynamic. So at least for this particular attractor, this Lorenz attractor, we have solved the closure problem. And I would say, I would say, I know this will work for any bound dissipative system like the Lorenz set. And there any strange attractor that you find in your math books that you want to study, you can use this approach. And I'll be looking at other ones in the future. Uh, you can get, you can close this system. You can't close it if it's not bounded and dissipative. But if it is, it will converge to a fixed point solution, a fixed point, a steady state solution where all the moments are contained uh, and explained in the attractor. My final statement is what I've just said applies to nonlinear quadratic equations down here at the bottom. If you do the general form of the stochastic dynamic equations, which I have derived the general form for nth moments, they're all of this form, just three separate kinds of terms. And uh, that's for a quadratic case. If your initial problem was nonlinear cubic and not just nonlinear quadratic, it's a more difficult problem. Now instead of three terms, you have five different classes of terms. But the same principle of closure would work here. It's just a little more complex. And I'm getting too old to take on that complexity, so I'm going to let somebody else do that. Thank you very much. I will take questions. Huh? This, this, is, uh, this is pretty tough math, I think. Um, any questions for uh, Rex? Well, to get back to John's uh, concern, I, I love computers and they're going to get extremely powerful, but even in, in my grandson's lifetime, they'll never be powerful enough to do the full stochastic dynamic approach. There's simply too many variables. We'll never be able to use this approach for that problem. However, uh, the Monte Carlo, again, as you pointed out yourself, if you get enough samples, you can converge to the stochastic dynamic solution. And that's what we're after. So if you get a large enough sample size, somebody could still sit down and write the equations and look at the, uh, the moments of Ed's equations and get a rough idea, you get an exact idea, but it'll be an approximation of what the Monte Carlo produces. So I think 
you'll be able to use both techniques to some advantage, but to perform the actual prediction like ECMWF does today, you're going to have to use the Monte Carlo approach. There's no question about that. They'll be dealing with not a billion different variables in the future. They'll have more physics involved. Uh, they'll be dealing with several billion. And so the Monte Carlo size will have to be many times that, perhaps, to get the proper approach to Ed's <coughs> stochastic dynamic solution. But that's the only practical way we can go. Thank you very much. Um, I think this, you know, this, is, this sort of ends our stochastic dynamic uh, session, and I think you can see how, how powerful this, uh, this idea was and how much influence it had on our weather prediction and so on and so forth. Tremendous, tremendous uh, thing that Ed brought through here and other people have carried on and are still studying and so forth.